Hello, everyone, and good afternoon, uh, especially to the IEEE Africa sections connected to this virtual salon. Welcome to Engineer for Change, or E4C for short. Today, we're pleased to bring you the E4C's virtual salon in partnership with the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, or IEEE, on the topic of renewable energy solutions. My name is Mariela Machado, and I'm program manager here at Engineer for Change. I'll be one of the moderators for today's salon. The salon you're participating in today is sponsored by IEEE in partnership with the IEEE Africa sections in Tunisia, Uganda, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. The salon topics are informed by the professional and regional interests of the sections. Participating sections schedule their meeting during the salon and will receive Q&A priority during this special event. If you're interested in hosting a virtual salon for your organization, please contact our webinars team. The salon you're participating in today will be archived on E4C and our YouTube channel. Both of those URLs are listed on this slide. If you're interested in additional webinars, information on our webinar series is available on our webinars page. E4C members will receive invitations to upcoming webinars directly. If you have any questions, comments, and recommendations for future topics and speakers, please contact the E4C webinar series team at webinars at engineeringforchange.org. If you're following us on Twitter today, please use the conversation, please join the conversation with our hashtag at hashtag E4C webinars. Before we move on to our presenters, I would like to tell you a bit about Engineering for Change. E4C is a knowledge organization and global community of more than 1 million engineers, designers, development practitioners, and social scientists who are leveraging technology to solve quality of life challenges faced by underserved communities. Some of those challenges include access to clean water and sanitation, sustainable energy, improved agriculture, and more. We invite you to become a member uh, since it's free and provides access to news and thought leaders, insights on hundreds of essential solutions in our solutions library, professional development resources, and current opportunities such as jobs, funding calls, fellowships, and more. E4C members also enjoy a unique user experience based on their site behavior and engagement. Essentially, the more you interact with the E4C site, the better we will be able to ser serve you resources aligned to your interests. We invite you to visit our website, www.engineeringforchange.org, to learn more and sign up. You can find examples um, of off-grid energy products like the Mobisol Solar Home System that you're seeing in the, on the screen on our E4C Solutions Library. There, you can learn more about technical performance, compliance with standards, academic research, and user provision models of these systems. All the information is sourced by E4C res research fellows and reviewed by our community of experts. It's available to our E4C members free of charge, so be sure to sign up. So a, a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, Let's take a moment now and practice using the WebEx platform. Please type right now on, in the chat window, what part of the world are you joining us from? Uh, if you're joining us from the Africa sections, be sure to type in what section are you joining us from. Use the chat window, which is located at the bottom right of your screen, and just type your location. If the chat is not open yet on your screen, try, try clicking the chat icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slide. Let's see where everyone is joining us from. Brooklyn, New York City, Michigan, Nigeria, welcome Nigeria, Seattle, Egypt, welcome, Cairo,
Nigeria. Welcome everyone, Luciana in Nairobi. To see we have everyone connected, welcome. Excellent. Um, let's go to additional. Now you know where the chat window is in case you you encounter any trouble and you want to type in any any comments. Okay. A couple of additional instructions before we get started. You can use this window uh, to share remarks during the webinar. And if you have any uh, technical questions, just send a private chat to Engineering for Change admin. If you're listening to the audio broadcast and you encounter any troubles, try hitting stop and then start. You may also want to try opening WebEx up in a different browser. During the webinar, please use the Q&A window located below the chat to type in your questions for the presenter. Again, if you don't see it, click the Q&A icon at the bottom of the screen in the middle of the slide. We'll gather these questions to ask the presenters at the end of the webinar. We'll leave at least 15 minutes before the hour and make sure that we ask all the questions to our presenters. Just as, re as a reminder for our IEEE Africa sections, if you, if you type any questions, please say which Africa sections are you joining us from since you are getting priority in the Q&A uh, during this virtual salon. Excellent. So without further to say, um, I would like to take a moment now to introduce, to introduce you to our moderator for today's virtual salon. Um, Henry, Dr. Henry Lewis, an associate professor and uh, Francis Wood Endowment Research Chair in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Seattle University. His, re his research areas include electricity access in developing countries, renewable energy and appropriate technology, He's also president and co-founder of Kilowatts for Humanity, a nonprofit organization providing electricity access and business opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa. Dr. Louis served as a Fulbright Scholar to Copperbelt University in Kidwe, Zambia. He's recognized as a distinguished lecturer of the IEEE and is an associate editor and the, of the Journal of Energy for Sustainable Development. He's also the author of the book Off Grid Electrical Systems in developing countries published by Springer Nature. He also hosted a couple of webinars, a series of webinars around this book, and we really invite you to check them out on our, on our website. Dr. Henry Lu, without further to say, and thanking you for moderating this virtual salon today, I pass it on to you to start the, the virtual salon. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. It's, it's great to be back uh, doing another webinar with uh, Engineering for Change. I've been involved with this organization for, for a while now, and last year had the, the uh, pleasure of doing a, a, a six-part webinar series based on off-grid electrical systems. So it's great to be back. Uh, we put together a, a great panel with uh, three speakers, uh, all of whom are, are based uh, in Africa, two in Kenya and, and one in Nigeria. And we've asked them today to talk about um, you know, some of the, the roles of renewable energy in, um, in combating energy poverty. And, and really, um, you'll see that the, the hot item right now is, is using uh, renewable energy to in, uh, increase access to electricity in off-grid communities. Now, before we get started, I, I do want to note that one of our speakers, our, our second speaker, uh, Ujenwa Ojemeni, uh, is having some trouble connecting uh, to us right now, so uh, we'll see if she's able to, in fact, uh, uh, join us. We might have to change our order a little bit uh, if, if she's able to come in, so we'll just kind of keep an eye on that. Uh, if, if she's not able to join us, uh, we'll just give our speakers a little more time to talk and also have a little more time uh, for questions at the end. Speaking of that, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to handle all the questions in a moderated fashion at the end of the session. So after, after our speakers have uh, spoken. However, if you do have questions uh, during the speaker's presentations, please do uh, chat the, uh, uh, type them into the chat window and, uh, and we'll do our best to cover all of them at the end uh, as a group. So with that uh, housekeeping aside, let, uh, let me introduce uh, our first presenter, uh, Kieran Campbell. Uh, Kieran Campbell works with the analytics team at PowerGen Renewable Energy, uh, which is based in uh, East Africa, Nairobi. So they're working on uh, mini-grid 
uh, Solutions, Solar Mini Grid Solutions. Uh, Kieran manages the, the development business intelligence, um, and in that role, he reports on customer behavior and power system uh, performance. Uh, I, I actually have a connection to PowerGen. Uh, my nonprofit was one of their early customers, uh, you know, five or six years ago, and, and it's been great to watch that that company just uh, skyrocket uh, since then. So they've come a long way. They've gotten a lot of good uh, uh, press and investment, and uh, I'm excited to turn it over to uh, to Kieran. So Kieran, let me just pass the the presentation tool to you, and uh, you're on. Great, thanks, Henry. Um, yeah, and thanks everyone for for joining. Um, excited to to share today about um, PowerGen and our work, and then um, hear your thoughts, um, answering questions towards the tail end of this. Um, so to really uh, kick this off, I'll just give you kind of a very high level overview of PowerGen, who we are, uh, what we've been doing all that time since um, since Henry worked us up with us in our, in our early days. Um, so PowerGen's taken a, a long and um, circuitous route um, since we were founded in 2011. Um, our early days, we were building um, small scale wind and we found out that was very hard. Um, and we switched to solar, uh, and then eventually found our way into solar mini grids, um, which we thought was an interesting business model. And then have been really pushing that forward um, to the point today where um, we're now operating in um, three countries um, with an office and a fourth. So in Kenya, Tanzania, and Sierra Leone, uh, and Nigeria as well. Um, and now managing. Um, uh, nearly 12,000 customers. Um, and so um, we have really settled on mini grids as kind of our bread and butter business. Um, but uh, I guess to, to start, what are, we, what are we working towards here? What's the, um, the challenge we're trying to address? Um, so I'm sh sure you're all aware, but um, it's on the, uh, on the continent um, of Africa, there's um, 600 million people that don't have access to reliable electricity, um, which is massive. Um, and um, it's the goal of the UN that by 2030, uh, everyone will have that um, under Sustainable Development Goal 7. Um, and so we can look at this and we can um, see this, this massive problem, but also look at it as a massive opportunity. Um, and so we think that the private sector has a unique role to play here. Um, if we can, sorry, there's a bird. Um, if we can get the funding needed um, to deploy the right solutions that can uh, connect people up. And so one of the solutions and what we've settled on um, is uh, what we're calling is there solar mini grids. Um, and so a, a mini grid, uh, as I'll define it, um, is a distributed energy system. Essentially the national grid that you and I all know, um, but kind of scaled down to serve an individual community. Um, so it'll power upwards of you know, 200, 300 homes um, using um, a generation resource kind of in the center of town. Um, for us, we developed solar. And, um, but it could be anything, hydro or wind. And that power is then distributed throughout that, that village um, through distribution lines, kind of poles and wires, until it reaches the customer's home. And then in each customer home, we install smart meters um, that uh, allow us to retail power that customers can pay for with their phones. So as you may know well, um, in East Africa, um, mobile money is very common. And that's a preferred name and a, uh, method of payment. Um, and so uh, we, it's in that way, a lot of these devices that we're deploying are internet enabled. So we can, um, we enable payments using the internet and we can track customer issues and system performance all from um, a remote location. And so where a lot of these systems, uh, these systems have like 
cutting edge uh, technology that um, it allows us to really um, ensure that we're providing reliable service. So where do kind of mini grids fit in um, within the available options for electrifying um, all these customers off grid? So I think what I'll say here is I think each, each of these solutions um, has a unique role to play uh, in, in connecting the off-grid customer. So traditionally, um, what's been used is uh, extension of the, the national grid. Um, and so that's a, um, you know, you'll take these, uh, the lines that already exist, just extend them out and then connect additional villages. But what we find is a lot of these villages are, are really far away hundreds of kilometers, um, point where it becomes very expensive to, to do that. And it's probably not the most uh, cost-effective cost way to, to hook people. And I think that's where uh, solar home systems and, and mini grids come in as, a, as really interesting solutions to, to provide um, power to people for the first time. Um, and so, um, for the solar home systems have really paved the way for what um, mini grids are doing today. So solar home systems are um, is a, and Laura, we'll get more into this later, um, but they're a, um, a standalone, like household level um, power system that, um, that is, has a really low uh, upfront cost and is easier for customers to pay off over time um, and provides like basic services. And then, and they're probably most ideal, I'd say, in, in areas that are really dispersed and not densely packed, and it may be too expensive for a mini grid. Uh, where I think mini grids play well is in this, this middle ground, where it's too far for the national grid, um, but you still have a densely um, uh, packed like, community where you can connect up um, 100, 200 people. And then um, it, one advantage is then you can power um, higher usage equipment, like um, machines and whatnot. So that's kind of what I see as um, the, the pros, cons, and um, benefits of each of these, these different solutions. I think uh, I touched on this a little bit before in describing um, the components within a mini-grid, um, but I think what we're what we hope to do, and our, our tagline is um, companies we're uh, transforming lives through smarter power, while developing the energy system of the future in Africa. And so it's that second part, developing the energy system of the future, that we're trying to deploy technologies that are at the forefront of what's happening globally um, in the energy sector. So we see even in in Western countries that um, uh, utilities are looking to De decentralize their grids and, and uh, create autonomy in certain areas through mini grids. Um, they're trying to add on sensors to parts of their uh, their network so they can detect issues and troubleshoot um, problems uh, remotely. Um, and they're trying to really focus more on the customer instead of just thinking that they're they're selling electrons. They want to make sure that they really understand their value proposition. Uh, and so we, uh, the company, are really trying to emulate those same, uh, same approaches, um, so that we're um, meeting that uh, these changes um, instead of um, you know playing catch up later. And so, yeah, I touched on this. So yeah, we're through these technologies and trying to, um, you know, we're by building what we're doing now. Uh, building mini grids kind of on the, the grid edge. Um, we, we think that we're allowing, um, mini grids are part of a, a general convergence um, of Africa's energy sector to, to uh, the globe. And so how, how do we get there? Um, the, 
I think the challenge and, and um, what we are really working to solve here is for mini grids to scale and really connect uh, all of these last mile consumers. Uh, we need to find ways to scale and get the, the funding needed um, to, to um, really um, uh, develop faster and, 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 and prove that this is a business model that can work and provide the returns that investors traditionally look to in uh, infrastructure-like projects, uh, which we consider mini grids to be. Um, and so um, that's why we're you know, focused on operational excellence and trying to reduce costs and improve um, the, the uh, revenues that customers produce. Um, so uh, it's uh, twofold. Um, Getting the right technologies out while um, uh, doing it in a, uh, doing it in a way that um, makes it financially sustainable as a model. And is one component here uh, an increase in revenues? Well, this doesn't happen in isolation. We uh, we're ultimately serving customers, and so uh, we as an organization have become ultra focused on our customer as. Um, as the end all be all and um, the uh, ultimately it's them that we we uh, we serve and we try to really prove our value proposition to them day in day out and so who are our customers um, our customers are uh, typically the, the rural poor so they are in um, off-grid areas, hundreds of kilometers from the main grid, uh, and a uh, majority live below the what we uh, typically define as the, the poverty line. But they're uh, what we um, what we connect up. They're both um, probably about two thirds of our customers are typical um, residential customers, your households, but they're also small businesses, um, uh, uh, either uh, hairdressers or um, their welders or um, you know um, small shops um, and um, yeah so they're ultimately um, varied and and we really try to suit our, our value to each of their needs um, and so how have we done that um, this kind of tailoring to um, to our customers um, it's, we have undergone a few different initiatives to really um, uh, prove our service as an electricity provider to our customers. Um, um, so, uh, you know, ultimately it comes down to your customers believe that Power Gen is a reliable and um, valued service provider. So, um, to prove that, we uh, really try to ensure that our our power service is, is reliable. So um, you know, typically, uh, what you see here for utilities, um, utilities will, uh, in, in Africa will have pretty um, atrocious like uptime. Uh, there's constantly rolling blackouts, um, but we try to cut against that. So our, our systems um, are available upwards of 98% of, of time, and, and um, we're trying to make sure that in addition to that, when customers uh, have complaints or want to uh, ha uh, have questions answered, that we are very diligent about um, answering those questions through our call center. Um, but we're also, we try to do things that are proactive to engage with customers as well. Um, whether that's um, doing outbound calls to key customers who, that we really, uh, uh, really value um, and want to engage with, or running promotions, um, we try to show that um, our customers are valued and that we are, um, we are a good value for money. Um, and I'll get into some other uh, issues in depth more, uh, primarily to start um, a new model that we've rolled out uh, called our local agent. So our local agent, um, essentially, uh, I mentioned at the outset that um, customers pay for power using their phone. 
with mobile money. But as you can imagine in uh, off-grid areas, uh, there's pretty poor internet connectivity, um, which would result sometimes in the past uh, that customers would send a payment, it would kind of get stuck uh, up in the cloud, and then we would get pretty angry phone calls from customers who uh, uh, were waiting on their payment to come through and register on their meter. Uh, and this was such a, a large problem that uh, we started brainstorming ways to, to get around this um, and ensure that customers would get power when they wanted it. Uh, and so that was the genesis of um, this idea um, to have a local representative at our sites um, who could purchase power credit from PowerGen um, and then retail it to our customers on, on our behalf um, for a, a small commission. Um, and it, it's been a, a really positive um, innovation for us. Um, we find that um, probably 80% of our transactions now go through this individual because customers really value the convenience of being able to go to someone and pay in cash, um, but also the, I think the face-to-face -face interaction with someone who is a PowerGen representative on site. Um, so that's um, one way that we've, we've uh, you know, continued to iterate on the model to ensure that customers um, are, are happy and um, appreciate uh, our service. And the um, say other way that we are really, um, this, these other initiatives that we're pushing on as of late to uh, improve the business model, um, ultimately we're, uh, you know, to ensure that customers appreciate our service, we are, uh, see us as value. They, we want to show that they also, like, have the means to use uh, our power. And, um, you know, it's one thing to have uh, a connection, but, um if there's no, there's no way to use power, or if they don't think that, you know, you know beyond just lights and sockets, we want to show that like people can, um, you know, do things like, you know, listen to radio or watch TV or, um, you know, keep drinks cold. Um, so we've started to offer kind of additional um, packages that customers could get upon connection. Um, so beyond, you know, if they want to have a few additional lights and sockets to fill additional rooms, they can do that. If customers want to buy um, some appliance from us on loan, uh, we, we have done sales trips to offer those. Um, and finally, like um, we have tried to uh, work with larger uh, customers who, who have uh, big equipment um, and see how we can um, you know, offer kind of more efficient equipment that will um, be valuable to them. Um, so this kind of gets that we're trying to address customer um, wants and needs in ways that also help the business model by increasing uh, usage of our power. And so touching on those first two, um, yeah, we've, we've done kind of with each new um, Set of customers that we connect, we we offer um, additional wiring packages, um, more lights and sockets, um, as well as uh, you know a catalog of appliances that we could make a return trip to to sell. Um, and I think the the value here is um, it's these are appliances that are often hard to find uh, um, in the uh, these communities um, just because there's not the right distribution of them to those sites. So, um, you know, customers would often use more power if they had access to the, the appliances that, you know, could allow that. Um, and so that's kind of the, the market gap that we're filling here. And I touched on this uh, at the end there, but, um, in addition to kind of uh, what you would consider more uh, residential type um, uh, appliances or internal wiring packages, uh, we've started to try to crack the code on how you uh, could hook up uh, larger equipment to our our systems. Um, 
So at many of our sites, you'll see um, kind of uh, milling machines that are, are used to uh, mill uh, maize that's kind of, um, you know, turned from a uh, kind of a kernel down to a uh, fine, fine grain powder, uh, which is used to make a staple food here at Ugali. Uh, and so these are um, uh, kind of pretty energy intensive machines that are run on um, diesel motors. Um, and um, so they're, they're pretty ubiquitous and they're all over. And so there's a really interesting um, opportunity that we've been trying to figure out, but how could you convert those machines um, so that they either use an electric motor or they could just be an electric um, uh, uh, piece of equipment themselves. So um, we have really like done a lot of R&D to figure out like, oh, how do, you, how do you integrate this? Do you have to adapt the system to have the right um, technical uh, requirements, like whether it's converting a line from one phase to three phase, you need, uh, you need maybe a, a motor that has like a, a soft startup or something kind of like that. Uh, a lot of technical challenges around, around this, but um, we're, we're getting much closer to it. And, um, and uh, actually in the next week or two, um, going to deploy uh, 10 or so milling machines in Tanzania at our sites. Um, and so why we've put so much focus on this, um, you know, we have a broad base of residential customers on our grids, um, but if you um, can figure out how to incorporate kind of what are anchor clients, customers who will use more power, that can really move the needle on um, your utilization of a system and help uh, make the financials work. Uh, at a lot of our sites, like these larger consumers could be upwards of 30 to 50 percent of the usage on the site. Um, so adding a few of those could really um, boost overall usage. Um, and but another barrier here has been in um, you can figure it out technically, but how do you convince a customer that they should buy this thing that uh, hasn't been proven to them yet and they've never seen and because there's generally low trust around um, would this work? And so the way we've tried to work around this is um, well, people believe things that they can see. So if we can go on the road and bring uh, this equipment and and run it there and they can go through the motions of milling at the site um, or, you know, welding with this engine, then they can kind of see, um, okay, this, this works. And oh, also PowerGen is going to um, finance the cost of this. So that can, that helps reduce the upfront barrier to purchase. Um, so that's kind of one way. It's it's both a technical challenge, but it's also been a marketing and sales um, challenge. And how do you incorporate these equipment? And I guess I'd I'd add um, why we call them productive use. Um, so I think our our theory of change here is um, we you know we know kind of broadly that access to power um, is is critical for economic development. And you can come look at that at like a macro scale. Uh, but we, we think that has to filter down to at the community level. So if you have um, businesses, businesses that are either, either created or enabled by access to power or can generate some sort of income uh, through that activity, um, we think that has kind of uh, overflow effects. So you you know if you enable a business that is generating income that's income that can flow back into using more power which is then creating this virtuous cycle of of development uh, and so that's why um we think not only does it help a, the the model in the near term but it can overall help with with growth in these communities Um, and I'll kind of wrap it up with um, kind of where we are now and what's kind of next. Um, so uh, yeah, PowerGen is, um, we are kind of full steam ahead on, on developing mini grids, um, both in 
uh, is primarily now in, in Tanzania, where we uh, we've closed financing for um, more grids, and then uh, in Sierra Leone as well. Uh, and our hope is that uh, we're at 12,000 connections now, hoping by end of year to be at um, at 20. Uh, and and really, we're just um, at the large scale. We're hoping to continue to push forward the narrative that um, mini grids are a um, a viable solution for rural electrification um, that um, they should be considered within kind of national electrification planning as um, uh, as something that uh, could be valuable um, and um, that um, partners and kind of investors should look to mini grids um, uh, and donors as well to kind of continue to um, progress um, scale up of this sector uh, enable um, mini grid developers to, to connect more customers um, uh, over time. Um, and then I'll leave you with a photo. Uh, this is uh, one of our customers at a site in um, a town called Wandoni, which is in the Singida region within Tanzania. Uh, and so her, her quote uh, said, power general electricity is helping me with my business. Uh, I can now put drinks in the fridge and watch TV uh, and I receive life comforts and feel like I'm in town. Um, and I haven't personally been to Lindoni, but uh, I've heard um, she's a great cook. Um, so uh, that's where I'll leave it. Um, and I think I'll hand it to Laura next. Yeah, great. Thanks for that awesome, uh, awesome presentation, uh, Kieran. So our, our next uh, speaker is uh, Laura uh, Sundblad, who is the Corporate Development Manager at Palami, which is another Kenyan-based um, uh, solar provider. They work in the, the solar home system uh, space, um, and they, they uh, do financing and the distribution of solar home systems. So. Uh, Laura leads the development of Kwame's growth and innovation strategy. She has uh, many years of international development experience, uh, primarily now working on the intersection of energy access and, and financial inclusion. Those are two, of course, key pieces to, to development. Uh, she's worked for ARC Finance and the Global Off-Grid Lighting Association in the past. And she's worked with a wide range of international partners, including private enterprise, impact investors, and microfinance institutions to improve access to capital uh, for the off-grid sector. So I'm uh, very excited to have uh, Laura with us today. She's going to um, uh, talk about uh, solar home systems and, and the role of, of, of them in, in this energy access problem and uh, how they're able to uh, get these systems in the, the hands of their users. So let's see. Um, I think you handed the, the ball off to Laura. So Laura, I think you're, you should be able to advance the slide. Yes, Perfect. thanks so much, Henry. Uh, thanks, Kieran, also for the presentation on PowerGen. So now shifting to PowerMe, uh, which, as Henry said, is a solar home system distribution and financing company. Uh, we are based here in Kenya, and at the moment we are operational in 14 counties in Kenya. And we are working on providing energy access as a gateway to financial empowerment and limitless opportunity in sub-Saharan Africa. So from 2020 and beyond, we are also looking at an international expansion. So today I'll talk a little bit about solar home systems and the role that they have in reaching SDG 7. And I'll also share a few thoughts around how people can get involved uh, in the off-grid solar sector as I often get inquiries from people who are looking to transition into the sector who have heard it's an exciting place to work, uh, which it is. So I'll share a few thoughts on that. Um, and I'm really keen to hear questions from the audience at the end um, and answer any questions that you have. I'll say for myself personally, I'm relatively new at PowerMe. I joined in July. Um, so before that, as, uh, as Henry mentioned, I was working at Gogla and at Arc Finance. So I'm also happy to take questions sort of on uh, lanterns and the sort of Pico um, solar space overall, although now um, I'm focused purely on solar home systems here at PowerMe. 
So looking at the core product offering of Palomi, we offer a solar home system that is really meant to be a stepping stone into electricity access. And we do this um, in sort of a two-tiered way. So we have our foundational product, which comes from Fosera, a German manufacturer, and offers access to light, to torches, to a radio, and to crucially mobile phone charging. And after customers have been paying back for some time, then they're able to upgrade to a TV included system. Now for us, what this solar home system means to our customers is that they can switch away from kerosene lanterns, they can switch away from uh, dry cell torches, they can switch away from going to charge their mobile phones in a nearby town or, or far away town more likely. And so it means that they have a lot more comfort um, and safety in their home. So most of our customers are uh, people with families uh, buying solar home systems for residential use. Uh, some of our customers do also use their solar home system for business use as a duka or a kiosk um, owner, but mostly these are really for improving quality of life at the home. And the way that uh, we operate, since we're a newer business, we've started in 2016, is that we decided to focus really on the consumer-facing part of the value chain. So that's why we you know, are supplier agnostic. We uh, procure products from the best suppliers that we can. We also procure software products from the best suppliers who are out there, rather than focusing on um, everything, which is what the sort of first generation solar home system company had to do. And so by focusing on the customer relationship, we can get more understanding about our customers, we can measure their um, payback history, so we can actually develop an in-house credit scoring tool to then use for selling more uh, livelihood improvement products um, or also selling financial services in time. So this year was the first year that we piloted school fee loans. So in Kenya, people pay school fees uh, three times a year. It's quite an investment for families and education is constantly rated as the top priority for families. And so we found that by offering a, a short-term loan during school fee season, specifically geared at families with um, children at school age, we were able to both ease their um, cash flows in that time and also to make sure that our revenues don't take such a dip during school fees. Um, in terms of solar home systems, um, they do range from sort of very small uh, multi-light systems to systems that power a lot more um, appliances. And Kira mentioned earlier that solar home systems are, are primarily uh, DC based, and that's true in the case of our solar home system. So we sell the system together with the appliances. Um, the appliances are very efficient so that we don't need such a large battery or panel. However, there is um, a lot of availability now also of uh, AC compatible systems, and we see those particularly, for example, in the Nigerian market uh, where people have already appliances that they want to power with solar. So there's a lot of range um, in the products that are out there, just as there's a lot of range in the customers. For us, as we're serving customers who about half of them are below the poverty line, we find it important that we have an entry level system that meets their needs while meeting also a high quality uh, threshold that we set. So here we're going a little bit more deeply into how the business model works. So uh, you might have heard of pay-as-you-go solar. It's been around sure, for the past decade. Um, it came really from the realization that while people were already spending money on uh, substandard products such as kerosene, uh, they were not able to uh, put savings together for the upfront cost of switching to a better technology. And so it became necessary to offer products in a way where people pay a smaller down payment and then pay over time 
and eventually unlock the system and have it uh, for themselves. And so what made Pago possible was really the development of a technology that allows remote lockouts. So the way that it works is that for us at PowerMe, a customer would meet a PowerMe agent. The agent would share information about the product and about the terms and conditions attached. If the customer decides to make a purchase, they pay the down payment through M-Pesa. And then our call center from Nairobi calls the customer to validate the sale to make sure that the customer has understood what they're buying, that they understood the financing terms. Then our technician actually goes to the customer's home and installs the product. So a lot of companies in the sector um, do not do in-home installations, but we found that since for most customers, this is their first solar home system, this is the first time they're interacting with this technology, it's better for us to go into the home and install it to make sure that the panel is actually on the roof uh, and not inside or on the ground, um, to make sure that the wiring is done correctly and to make sure that the customer knows how to, um, how to insert tokens into the system and how to use it. And then once the installation is done, we again call the customer and check that they are happy with it, that everything's working fine. And then they start making daily payments again through M-Pesa. So here in Kenya, we're really quite lucky with how pervasive mobile money is. Um, I know that in Nigeria, it's a little bit different. So pay as you go solar companies there either do have some mobile money partnerships, but then also enable payments in different ways through, for example, remote banking agents. But here we go through the uh, pure mobile, through purely through mobile money. And as customers pay back, uh, we do track how they pay. And as soon as a customer doesn't pay for four days, we give them a call and ask what's going on. So pay as you go does have some flexibility. Customers are able to make payments when they have money and then uh, not pay when they don't. But if they don't make a daily payment, that does mean that the system shuts off. Um, and this is something where we're looking at different ways to incentivize customers to pay for a longer time upfront. Um, but most of our customers prefer making daily payments because that is how they make money. Um, so they are selling uh, products in their kiosk or they are selling um, milk to the dairy cooperative. They're, they're doing things daily and so they pay us also daily. Um, and then the third part, which is crucial for us, is you know we're investing heavily into building this customer network and to build our customer understanding and gathering this data, analyzing it, going out to the customers, interacting with them. And so what we really are looking to do as we mature as a business is to offer other services and products that can improve the lives of our customers. So as I mentioned, we piloted our school fee loans. We're also now developing a pay-as-you-go smartphone to help um, expand digital connectivity here in Kenya, because there's still quite uh, some gaps in terms of access to, to mobile internet. And of course, with mobile internet, then you have access to a whole host of other uh, services. We're also looking at things like water harvesters, um, we're looking at insurance, and part, some of these will come from us directly, and some of them will come through partners. So for example, for insurance, we wouldn't build um, an insurance company because that's not our core business, but we can very uh, likely partner with a micro-insurance company who's looking to expand their reach, and that way it's a win-win-win for us, for the customer, and for the other company as well. So here's one of our customers. This is Margaret Nora Tiren. Uh, she is a mother, a kiosk owner, and a Palami customer since two years ago. Um, so we wrote a case study on Margaret. Uh, you can uh, access it through our website, uh, through our partnership with W Power, which is a network looking at uh, women and gender equality in the off grid or in uh, renewables in general. And so. With, um, with customers who, these are the kinds of uh, customer relationships we want to cultivate. So we really want to be a brand that our customers trust, 
Uh, we want to be a partner for them over the longer term. We want to offer sort of choice and flexibility. And I think that's something that's still relatively new in the electricity sector, which has focused very much on the macro level of, uh, you know, how many kilowatts are needed? Where does the grid line go? How does transmission work? And in um, off-grid solar, so both solar systems and in mini-grids, we really start with the customer and we start with their needs. We start with their aspirations. We start with their income, with their uh, hopes and their dreams. And then it's really crucial that we value that trust that they give us when they buy a whole new technology into their home. And that's something that for me is, is um, really the driving force in, in my work and why I've stayed in the sector for so long. Uh, is because we see impact quite quickly. Um, and I, I really believe that there is space for uh, every solution in this market. But with solar home systems and, and with lanterns, we can move quite quickly. And, you know, if, um, if the Kenyan grid, for example, expands in 10 years to some of the areas that we work in, and people are able to get a grid connection in 10 years, that's great. Um, but, you know, within that 10 years, that's, for example, if a baby is born today, that's the first 10 years of his life. And so it's better to have the solar home system right away, um, have better access to education, have better access uh, to a healthy indoor environment. So that's, uh, that's my driving sort of force in, in staying in the sector is seeing development impacts quickly and with the customer at the heart of everything that we do. So speaking then a little bit more broadly about the impact that we've had uh, here in Kenya. So Margaret is one of our customers, um, but we have at the moment about 7,000 other customers who are active in our system. And in addition, over 1,000 customers have already paid back their system in full. So that means that the system is unlocked and it's theirs to use. So that means that we've been able to help families save on energy expenditure because they're able to move away from kerosene or from dry cell torches uh, or from paying for mobile charging. We're also able to avoid CO2 uh, emissions because kerosene lanterns emit a lot of black carbon um, and are both harmful for the planet, but they're also harmful for uh, help. They are a major cause of indoor air pollution. We're able to help people create additional income. So whether that means that they can work later in the evening or whether they can um, get to their workplace earlier in the morning if they go before um, sunrise, there's a lot of different ways in which people can, can use their product. They can even um, sell mobile charging uh, for a fee. And so overall, we've um, We've improved the lives of, of over 40,000 people. And of course, as we're rapidly growing, that number will continue to rise. And I want to mention briefly also that um, we have committed now to the Gogla Consumer Protection Code. So Gogla is the industry group for the, uh, the off-grid solar industry. And we have put together um, a set of principles for consumer protection that companies in the industry are now signing up to, so including Palomy. Um, and in this consumer protection code, what's crucial is that we are transparent with our customers, we treat them with respect, uh, our pricing is fair, and we protect their data. So there's a, there's a host of these kinds of um, good business practices that are important to build and maintain that trust, and I'm really proud that, that Palomy is committed um, to those principles. So I want to look then briefly at the road ahead um, before I hand over back to Henry and for questions. So sometimes I get the question, you know, well, what's the point of solar home systems since, you know, the grid is in any way, the grid, the grid is what we want and the grid is uh, what governments want. Um, and there, you know, it is true, of course, that solar home systems alone don't replace the grid. So solar home systems won't power sort of heavy industrial efforts or uh, large institutions. Um, but at the same time, uh, we can't really wait uh, for the grid to reach everyone. 
uh, if we, according to SE for All, if we go at the current rate, there will still be almost 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa without access in 2030. And so that's what I alluded to earlier in terms of we, we need to move more quickly. And with solar home systems, uh, it's the easiest way to, to do that. Um, and then another question that I get is, you know, how about here in Kenya? Because KPLC has, has done a lot of work um, in grid electrification, and this is also the sort of hotbed of off-grid solar. This is the home of Mcopa Solar, which is the largest pay-as-you-go company um, in the world. But even here, there's still about a quarter of the population who don't have electricity access. So there's, for us, as we're looking at international expansion, we're also looking very much at how do we penetrate more deeply in the counties that we're in, and how do we also go into more of the underserved counties uh, here in Kenya. And so I'm a firm believer that we can accelerate access, um, and to do that, we need people. Uh, we need policy, so we need the government um, to give support, um, give funds, or at least to you know, enable um, a tariff structure in terms of import tariffs that works for, for the sector. And we need private sector efforts, and there's really space for a lot of companies here. And this is something where um, the off-grid solar sector, or rural electricity access in general, is so exciting because it does combine private sector and, it, um, and public sector for sort of maximum impact. And so I, I mentioned that I wanted to speak a little bit about how you can get involved in this space. And so um, as you know, some of you on the webinar might not be as familiar with the types of roles in um, off-grid solar as they're a little bit different than in conventional um, power sector. So what I see, um, for example, as our needs at Palami, but also more generally in the sector, there's a lot of need for people uh, at different levels in data science and analytics, because that's a key driver of the industry. Related to that, there's a need for software development and engineering. On the hardware side, so Palami doesn't do hardware R&D, so this is not so relevant to us. But in general, there's still scope for improving the products that are out there, improving efficiency, getting appliances to work with even less um, an energy input. And then there's a, a real big need for finance professionals. And so there's these, these companies, these fancy go solar companies are a hybrid of uh, consumer goods, financing, and electricity access. And so, um, there is a need for people with strong understanding of portfolio management, uh, of investment, of consumer finance, and, and there's also a lot more. So there's also need for researchers, there's need for um, people with ethnographic research skills, there's a um, need for people with strong HR skills. So um, do check out the companies in Off-Grid Solar if you're interested in being involved. Uh, there's also lots of programs for visiting fellows or for sort of more short-term um, exchange of expertise. And so I do hope that um, between Kieran and me and, and hopefully um, with the third panelist, we're able to invite some of you to um, dig a little bit deeper into the sector and, and potentially join us because it's really a fun, diverse, uh, dynamic place where no day is the same. Um, and there's so much to do um, and so much sort of progress to be made. So with that, um, I'll hand it back to Henry and I really look forward to your questions. All right, all right. Thank you so much, Laura. So uh, unfortunately, despite our feverish efforts behind the scenes to get um, uh, Ugenwa connected to us, that's still we're still having some trouble. So I think what we're going to do is we're going to move into the, the Q&A portion, and uh, if she is able to, to join us, we'll invite her to uh, interact with uh, us in that, uh, answering those questions. So I'll, I'll pose a general question, and while I'm doing that, if you're in the audience and you have questions that you want our panelists to ask, go ahead and enter them in the chat. If you happen to be at one of the IEEE um, sites, go ahead and, and make sure you put that uh, as a, a 
uh, preamble to your question, and I'll make sure that it gets gets uh, asked. So to start off, you know, I, I've been involved in this area for 10 or 11 years, and it always uh, struck me as to, you know, why, why aren't we seeing, why didn't we see mini grid solar home systems, solar lanterns coming out 20 years ago? Why has it only been in the last five or 10 years that we're, we're, we're starting to see this? So, Kieran, I'll, I'll uh, ask you to, if you have some thoughts on that first, and then Laura can follow up. Sure. Um, yeah, I think um, the emergence of uh, solar home systems and uh, mini grids, uh, I think early on, a lot of it was um, due to uh, cost declines in a lot of these technologies or emergence of new technologies. So when I say you know, about cost declines, I think, you know, our systems rely upon um, solar panels and and batteries um, and that are pretty core and uh, one of the more expensive components in the systems. Uh, and so maybe 15 years ago, before we saw real price declines in those, uh, those technologies, uh, developing a mini grid or solar home system probably would have been uh, prohibitively expensive um, for these customers. So it was only you know, through that kind of cost decline that uh, we could start to sell power or solar home systems, solar home systems at um, a competitive price uh, for um, these customers. Um, that's kind of one. And then I think two is really like the, um, the emergence of, uh, at least in East Africa, the emergence of um, mobile money um, as, a, as a payment method um, through M-Pesa first and then um, you know, with other uh, carrier cents. Um, that um, allowed for um, consumers in remote locations to to um, pay for systems where they're maybe uh, sold, um, you know, uh, sold from a central point, and and that made it much easier to to track kind of follow up of um, of these sales and and um, and manage um, these sales once they were kind of out there. Um, so I think that those are probably the two things I would call out. Great, Laura, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I think of course the the fall in the cost of the components is really key, as Karen mentioned, and mobile money has certainly propelled the growth here in East Africa. I think the other thing that has shifted in the past ten years is thinking from both donors and from governments on how electricity access can be organized. Um, and so previously, as I mentioned, it, it was really more large scale infrastructure grid expansion. And that was sort of at the heart of the efforts of, um, say, the World Bank. And now we see, for example, here in Kenya, a really innovative new program called COSAP, looking at how the World Bank, the Kenyan government, private fund managers and the private sector together can offer a combination of grids, off-grid solar and grid electricity access to uh, counties that have previously had poor access to, to electricity. So that mindset shift to having decentralized solutions as part of the overall solution has also been helpful in, um, in increasing the growth of the sector. Yeah, great, great. Exciting times to be involved in this space for sure. Okay, we have a, a question from one of our IEEE um, uh, sections here that th the question asks, um, you know, who, who's, um, when, when we look at the renewable energy that's, uh, that's deployed in, in Africa, you know, I, I think, oh, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but, you know, wh why is it so much solar now and, and why, uh, and, and how do you assess the uh, the performance of the, the installation. So why is it, it, it primarily solar being selected? Um, what are some of the reasons for that? And then, you know, how, how well are these solar installations doing? Laura, do you want to start off on that one? Uh, sure. I mean, for for our scale, for really household level systems, Solar is kind of the only option. Um, 
sort of there have been some efforts um but i mean things like micro hydro or uh wind turbines might work for for a mini grid or a micro grid but karen can speak to that um you know why that hasn't taken off in the same way but um yeah for us sort of as a as a household level uh, technology solar is safe um it's easy to install it's easy to maintain uh, the costs have come down it's uh you know superior to using for example diesel um which you know you, you can have household level diesel generators which can power a lot of appliances but then have a continuous cost um of course a continuous environmental impact and a hazardous uh, impact to the household as well so you know for a for a solar home system level or household system level solar is really the only option yeah yeah um i would say it for um uh, microgrids um you i guess you do see um uh hydro mini grids as well um but they tend to be more like it's a a large scale hydro project it just happens to have a, a mini grid kind of bolted on because it's uh um there's a town right there that you could hook up with distribution lines um so they do exist um but i think um why solar over maybe wind um so while they're both um variable resources um solar is variable in a more predictable way um and it's um you know you so you're not depending on wind speeds at certain times and it's easier to size the system kind of around that. So if you can estimate um, the load that consumers will will uh, need, that you'll need to serve, um, and you know between solar batteries and a um, a generator, you can appropriately size the system to kind of meet that that load. Um, so it's a much easier uh, resource for general grid planning. Hello, Harry. Oh, yes. Okay. I hope you can hear me now. Uh, we have another question. Uh, this one, Kieran, is directed more towards you. Have you considered using 12-volt uh, DC to uh, supplement the AC that you provide, primarily for um, um, lighting to, to uh, yeah, I guess, complement the AC that you're providing? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, we have looked into this, um, um, primarily I think because um, I guess we, in some places we've gone, we've found um, consumers have already um, already have maybe DC appliances from a solar home system that they they owned in the past. Um, I think what we settled on, I think we we distribute the. Oh man, this bird. <laughs> uh, we uh, we distribute to the household in AC because I think you need some sort of um, AC DC coupler kind of at the household level, which um, adds some expense. And I'm no engineer here, but uh, I think it added um, it was technically easier just to kind of continue with uh, AC to the home uh, and then add on the sales of AC appliances as well. Yeah, it's uh, that constant battle of AC versus DC, right? Uh, okay, a, so we have we have a, a question uh, for for Laura here. Uh, it has to do with the the maintenance and repair of the system. So who, who's responsible for that, and uh, how long does that go? If you have three year uh, payment contract, what happens in in year uh, year four? Uh, sure. So, well, every company organizes this slightly differently. Here at Palami, um, we have a year and a half payment term and we have a three year warranty. Um, so for that three years, uh, three years for the coal system. So it's, uh, it's your one year for the appliances. Now within that warranty, um, 
that comes from our manufacturer and we pass it on to the customer. And we then send out our technicians to service customers when they have issues. The way that it works is that the customer gets in touch with our toll-free number, our customer care number here in Nairobi, uh, talks about the issue that they're having. We try first to troubleshoot uh, on the phone. And then if that doesn't work, then we open a product ticket and then look to uh, close that as soon as possible for the customer. Now, we are looking constantly at ways in which we can improve that process and also to make sure that we're really educating the customer uh, even more thoroughly. So our systems are relatively, you know, simple. They're pretty robust. There's not a lot of moving parts, but there are some basic things that you need to know, for example, about keeping the panel clean. And so we are actively looking at ways in which we do that better. But we do offer um, this three-year warranty for the system. Uh, we're looking also at, you know, what should we offer? As, so right now, Palami is three years old. <laughs> And so we're, we're starting to get some of the post-warranty questions now, and we're looking at, okay, do we sell repair services also for uh, customers whose warranty is ex have expired? Right now, we don't do that yet, um, but it's definitely something we're looking at actively. So with our solar home systems, customers can use them for about five years um, in total, and at that point, typically, you would want to replace the battery. Um, but, you know, the systems can go on for, for longer than that. But up to the three years of the warranty, they're covered under us. Great, great, thanks. Um, I think we'll <clears throat> move, so uh, actually before we move on, um, we have some kind of behind the scenes chatter going on if, uh, um, uh, Ojunwa, if you happen to be connected, um, maybe you can you can uh, identify yourself in the chat window to one of us, and we can maybe try to uh, unmute you. Uh, it's, it's hard to know which which call and number you're at. Uh, so while that's going on, uh, we have a, <clears throat> a, a another question uh, directed to Karen and PowerGen. Uh, have you looked at any combined heat and power uh, in any your installations? Um, no, not really. Um, I, no, I wouldn't say so. Um, <laughs> not your target market. Yeah, but, no, not our target market. I think we've, uh, just been pretty head down on just figuring out how to make the solar part work before we uh, diversify. Um, uh, yeah. Um, I, I couldn't tell you why we haven't looked at it, but, uh, <laughs> I haven't heard of those looking things. Sure, great. And I imagine, Laura, that's that's far too large of a scale for a solar home system to, to consider. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, one thing I found very interesting in, in both of your presentations is this uh, expansion or, or creep beyond just the the uh, sole provision of electricity, uh, getting into financing, getting into leasing, um, uh, and making available appliances. Um, you know, wh where do you think this ends? Uh, is, is I've heard people talk about the opportunity to create credit profiles uh, for people in rural areas, which has never been done before, so that you can even unlock greater finance uh, opportunities. Are we just scratching the surface in terms of using electricity to access people and then provide them other uh, goods and services? Or have we reached a point where we think we've, we've kind of gone through uh, all of the opportunities that are there? I'll let either one of you respond to that first. Uh, there's definitely still a lot of opportunity out there. I do think we're at the beginning. So, I mean, the pay-as-you-go sector has introduced all kinds of appliances, different services, um, but even as an industry, we're still quite young. Um, Power Me as a company within that industry is of the younger end as well. Um, so, I mean, getting products to people in remote or rural areas is quite an undertaking. And once you have reached those customers, you do really want to build lifelong partnerships with them, or at least long-term partnerships. 
And that's why, you know, having that trust, as I mentioned, is so crucial. So what we're looking at at Pawami is what are the services that we can offer that really improve livelihoods? So we don't want to just push out any product. Uh, we want to offer things that are high quality and really add value to our customers. But I think in terms of uh, financial inclusion, a pay-as-you-go product is often the first formal financial product that a customer has. And so that can unlock uh, future services. And we already see this, you know, for us, for example, in terms of we can look at which of our customers have good repayment rates and then become eligible for a TV upgrade or who is eligible for the school fee loan pilot. Because, um, of course, we have to also be honest about uh, which type of product is the right type of product for the right type of customer. So not every product is for everyone. Um, but if we can get digital connectivity out to consumers, if we can get uh, financial services beyond just credit, so also insurance uh, or savings, um, then we do start to unlock much more potential uh, in rural communities. And we also then are able as a, as a business to you know, spread some of that customer acquisition cost over a longer period of time with more products and services offered to a customer over their life cycle. And so, yeah, I think we're really just at the beginning and I'm really excited to see sort of all the innovation that's coming up in the sector um, and, you know, what's, what will be in the next five years. Because when I look back, you know, the last five years, a lot has happened. Uh, I don't think anyone would have really imagined how quickly this can take off. Um, but now it's really looking at, okay, both spreading the reach, but also deepening the relationships that we have. Um, yeah, yeah, well, but, um, I think um, just for mini-grids, I think um, mini-grid developers so far haven't um, gone as deep, I think, as some, we've seen some solar home system companies go uh, where um, they expand along these different verticals. But I think in the way that we've done it, we try to, you know, selling appliances is a um, additional vertical, but the, it it supports kind of our core business of, of selling power. Um, and so it's a value add, a value added service that we, we offer. Um, but we have explored, you know, is there um, avenues like um, if we can uh, sell Wi-Fi to customers, that's something that does consume electricity, but it's not, um, it's just another um, service that we could get into. Um, but I guess the one we probably also pour it into is, um, uh, water sales. So if we can do kind of water pumping at a in a village, that is something that uh, complements. It consumes electricity, but it's also um, is what we found is often a pain point in villages where there may be um, boreholes at site that have are either untapped or um, or um, yeah, just not being utilized. And um, and if we can uh, get the equipment set up, that could be um, Something else to to kind of uh, to enter into and 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 really support the community with um, in that way. Um, so uh, you're right. It's, it is a lot to explore explore still, and um, I think we're we're trying to do it in a way that uh, we don't get too distracted with too many different uh, shiny um, new initiatives. But uh, as long as it it fits in nicely with what we're already doing. Great. It's going to be exciting to see uh, where, where this goes. Uh, now, I, I know uh, John uh, is in, in Nigeria, and he might have some uh, live uh, questions, questions that weren't asked in the chat. John, if you are able, uh, let's, let's see if you have any uh, questions from your audience there. Um, thank you, Erin. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. The only question we have is um, who is in charge of um, the installation of renewable energies in Africa and who does the need assessment after the completion of the project? Can you repeat that last part, Larry? 
who does the need assessment after the project is completed in Africa? Or okay, renewable? So who, who does, so who does the assessment uh, uh, after the projects have been implemented? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Karen or Laura, do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, assessment of what? Which component? The the uh, the assessment of of the project. So I think the question has to do with um, uh, you know after the project's been been completed, uh, who who goes back and 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 assesses how successful it was. Um, Thing. I guess I don't know if we, I mean, we do commissioning reports around projects once we're done building it. Um, but I, I think it's generally just um, kind of ongoing uh, monitoring and reporting on um, how things are going and kind of um, it's, um, you know, we're continuing to track things like uh, how well is the, the actual uh, system performing like is it does it seem like um, you know we're utilizing the resources we have well or generators running all the time um, and you know can we find faults um, so we're always kind of looking at our sites and trying to get alerts on when something has gone awry um, but then that's kind of from a power system perspective where we're tracking um, then we're also looking at like what what are customers doing over time like um, are they trends in usage and spend, um, you know, how, um, how are they kind of engaging with our service and what uh, pain points do they have? Um, so uh, we don't really formalize that in kind of like a, a an assessment on like uh, here, here it is at the end, uh, this is what we found. And it's more just kind of over time we're, we're, we're continuing to watch and, and see how things develop. I hope that answered your question. Yeah, thanks. I think I think we'll move on to uh, a question that's uh, directed uh, to uh, to Laura here. So the uh, the question is, you know, what what criteria um, do you use to identify customers? And then secondly, you know, how do you how far is your distribution reach? Are are you targeting people closer to towns or um, in in really far flung areas? Sure. Um, so for us, in terms of customer selection, the key uh, piece of information is really, are they willing and able to pay the down payment? Um, and there's a lot of discussion in the sector on whether you can use data in some way to screen customers. Um, but the truth is that, you know, at least for us at our scale with 7,000 customers, which is still relatively small, we don't have sort of robust enough data that would be unbiased enough to really make a screening decision based on our past customers. So it would it would result in a bias. Um, so for us, and we've heard this also from uh, investors and, and others who have you know looked at the industry, the down payment is really something where sort of the rubber meets the road and the customer is really making a clear uh, claim that this is something that they value and that they want to buy. And that's really crucial for us because, again, we're not just pushing products. Uh, we want this to be a choice for the customer and an informed one. Um, and then making that payment is a sort of clear indication that, um, that they want the product and that they're also able to put at least that much money together to pay for it, which indicates um, that they are able to pay in the future. And then, of course, as customers join, then we can uh, learn more about them. We can learn when they pay, when they don't pay, uh, who pays, who doesn't, um, and be in touch with customers proactively uh, if we if I identify customers that might be uh, more risky. Um, what was the second question? Uh, the second question had to do, or the, the second part of this this question had to do with. Uh, you know, your customers, are they, are they clustered closer to the larger towns or are they uh, in, in quite rural areas? And how do you get okay. them to the, the rural areas? Yeah, so the answer, uh, well, most, so we are in 14 counties, um, sort of all along the um, western border of Kenya. 
We do have a lot of customers in and around Kisumu, which is the third largest city uh, in Kenya. But then we do also have sales all the way up in Turkana, uh, as well as in the Kakuma refugee camp, which is uh, remote but dense, uh, so a little bit different than most places. Now, of course, logistically, it is easier to reach customers that are closer to towns. It's easier for our sales agents, it's easier for our county managers. Um, but we're constantly looking for ways to spread our reach within the counties that we're in and then also go further. Um, one of those opportunities uh, is provided by this, uh, this COSAP program, uh, the World Bank funded program, which looks specifically at how do we get off-grid solar into more remote locations. Um, but, you know, it is a, it's a business reality that uh, customers who are closer to our sort of distribution hubs and closer to our sales agents are the ones that we reach first, uh, and then we go further from there. Great, great. Uh, we're, we're nearing the, uh, the end of our time here, uh, but I do want to ask uh, uh, one, one other question to the panelists here. You know, I, I, I'm a professor at a Jesuit university, so I always have to explore some of the, the ethical questions that are, are out there in this space. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you two options, and you can pick which one you, you might want to address. Well, the first has to do with um, data privacy. So uh, many good companies, uh, solar home system companies, collect a lot of data from a lot of users, and, and we've identified some ways that that can be uh, leveraged to offer other products, services, et cetera, which many of which are beneficial. But, you know, in, in the United States and in Europe and so forth, we take our data privacy very uh, seriously. So I'm wondering if there's any, uh, any protections out there, uh, any, any guidelines that have been proposed to what to do with that data, how to share it or not share it. Uh, the other question, um, it has to do with e-waste. So, you know, we, we're putting a lot of batteries out there, a lot of electronics, you know, what do, what do we think of uh, recycling disposal? Is that an open problem? Do we have good solutions yet? So feel free to just nibble at either of those questions uh, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, and maybe I'll start with uh, with Laura on this one. Okay, well, I'll, I'll nibble a little bit at both of them, uh, just okay. because uh, both of them are really pertinent and things that are discussed in the industry a lot. Uh, on data privacy, that is part of the consumer protection code that I referred to earlier. Um, at PowerMe, we've taken the line that we do not sell our customers' data, so we do collect a lot of it and we do use it internally. Um, we do look also at how do we actually keep that safe. I mean, we're, we're a relatively uh, small company, so probably not as interesting for hackers as, as one of the bigger ones, um, but we of course do need to keep our customer data safe, and that's part of being a trusted partner. So for us, the customer data is, is not for sale, uh, and that's a key sort of defining baseline. And then we're working, you know, to learn more on what we can do, and then we rely also on, on Google to work on this um, as an industry. Uh, a lot of the thinking so far has come from learning from mobile network operators who, of course, worked with data privacy for a long time. On e-waste as well, actually, Gogla has been doing quite a lot of work, also with CLASP, uh, which is a, um, another international organization. For us, you know, we're just getting into this stage, as I mentioned, since we're three years old. Um, our products are a three-year warranty, so we're getting into that space. Now, e-waste in general is not a problem that is limited to off-grid solar. It's a much bigger um, problem that, you know, in the end, the Kenyan government will also need to tackle. And so, you know, we're very willing to work with sort of developing different solutions, but at the moment, our, our line is that just that we don't leave that problem to the customer. We collect the products back at the end of their life. Um, but then in terms of a final, you know, solution for, for e-waste, that's something that we still need to work on together, I think, also together uh, with the mini-grid sector. For sure, for sure. Okay, Karen, I'll turn it turn it over to you. You've got about a minute here. Cool, great, thanks. Um, okay, on the data privacy uh, question. Um, so, I guess like uh, Google, uh, the industry association for 
mini grids. Uh, it's called AMDA. Um, is putting together um, sim very similar consumer protection um, rules, um, and we'll probably model it quite closely off of what um, Google has done. But I think, um, in general, as an organization, we we take data privacy very seriously, and uh, yeah, don't sell it. And um, we uh, have very strong and like uh, good controls on kind of who we share data with and uh, who has access to to our customers' data. Um, then on the uh, battery waste question, um, yeah, I think um, it's helpful. So our um, so our batteries, we uh, we have processes in place to uh, return them to the manufacturer who buys them back at the end of their lifetime. Uh, I think the company Chloride Exide, um, and so we're compliant with a lot of the environmental regulations from uh, entities like regulators like NEMA, Nawara in Tanzania. Um, so yeah, take that very seriously and make sure that it's uh, handled well. Great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good to see that these are topics that, that are, are being discussed in industry. So um, let's, let's wrap it up here. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for your time uh, to our presenters. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, Genoa wasn't able to, uh, to, to connect with us. Maybe we'll have her at a, a future uh, future webinar, and I'll turn it over to uh, Mariella, who will uh, present the closing slides. Thank you so much, Henry, and thank you, Kieran and Laura. This was super insightful. Um, thank you so much for everyone that participated, especially the IEEE Africa sections. We truly appreciate, you know, how interactive this conversation was. Um, to obtain your PDA certification, um, you have the link there. If you have any questions, reach out to us. We appreciate your time. Um, and, you know, as a last comment, and unfortunately, we didn't have, have Uyungwa uh, jump in. She's uh, based in Nigeria, so we have appreciated her perspective in this discussion. What we will try to do is uh, record her slides and um, send it over to, to everyone that signed up for this webinar so that we capture her perspective. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't get her um, to connect, and that's you know part of the the problems that we face in certain parts of the world with connectivity. But well, we'll make sure to send it over to uh, to you guys, the ones that are here and the ones that that register. Thank you so much, uh, Henry, for a great conversation as always. Thank you, Kieran, and thank you, Laura. Till next time, and have a great afternoon or end of your day. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank you.